Hi, hi everybody. Um, nice to see you all here. Um, I've, I've got this quote by Helen Keller up, and you might have seen this. I know Jeff Golden puts it on his, uh, his uh, note that he sends out. But I love it because we live in a time when um, we often feel really helpless in terms of having an impact. And um, I, I would like to encourage all of you to do at least one thing a day that will improve the community and the world. And um, I think planting native plants is a big part of that. That's something we can do um, on an ongoing basis and encourage others to do. So there you go. And uh, Lynn, before we go into it, um, I'm just gonna talk some quick shop for everybody real sure. quick. So um, welcome everybody to Growing Native Plants presented by Jackson County Library Services. I'm Kayla, one of your adult services librarians. If you are new to Zoom, please use the microphone icon to mute and unmute yourself. If you'd like to ask questions, we ask that you wait until the presentation is over and that you utilize the chat function. Um, to utilize the chat function, all you have to do is click on the three dots and select chat. If uh, you are very interested in gardening <coughs> and growing plants, I'd like to take this time to mention our online program that's happening November 7th, where we will be discussing growing pollinator gardens with Christina LaFerver. You can register for this event at jcls.org. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Jackson County Library Services. And now I'd like to present our speaker this morning, Lynn, who will be leading our discussion about growing native plants. Take it away, Lynn. Thanks very much, Kayla. <laughs> So um, why native plants? Uh, so this is a, a presentation about saving nature one yard at a time. And it's based on the work of um, Doug Tallamy, uh, who is a professor at um, University of Delaware. And his latest book, Nature's Best Hope, um, is, is part of what this presentation is based on. Um, and special thanks to Tom Landis and Susie Savoy, two of our local folks who um, are, are um, important shakers, movers and shakers in the native plant uh, community. Uh, Susie Savoy owns Klamath Siskiyou Seeds, where you can purchase native seeds. So um, if you don't know who Dr. Tallamy is, this is his latest book, Nature's Best Hope. And there is a link on the other side of this page um, Hope for the Wild is one of his YouTube presentations. He has tons of them out there. Um, they're terrific and fun to watch. Um, his most, this is his most recent. And if you email me after the presentation, I'll send you the link for the slideshow and you can review the, the, the links that I've got here in the presentation. Um, so there's a little bit about me. I grew up in the Bay Area. I have two sons and a husband. We moved here in 1986. I have a bachelor's in wildlife management from Humboldt and a master's in science education from SOU. Um, I retired from middle school special ed and science teaching, and I volunteer now at Master Gardeners and the Medford Food Project. So let's jump in. The problem, why should we care about what's going on in the world? Well, um, we all have heard of the insect apocalypse. Over 45% of insects worldwide are now threatened with extinction. Um, we, we, we know about the loss of habitat because of privatization and agriculture and all the other things that are going on um, in our world as, we, as a human population grows and loss of birds and other wildlife. Um, since 1970, we, in North America, we've lost over 3 billion birds. So these are very kind of dire um, statistics and um, I, I, we wanna talk about those. So what are the drivers of the loss? Well, um, industrial agriculture, which just turns large swaths of land into monocultures, roads and the hazards that they present for all kinds of wildlife, um, unnecessary lights, which is an interesting thing that a lot of people don't think about tens of millions of acres of sterile lawn, and that is something we can do something about. Um, 
and then wide destruction, wide widespread destruction um, and displacement of native plants. Um, so uh, we're not going to be able to addressing the insect issue. We're not going to be able to survive without our insects. They support our food webs. On the left, you see our European honeybees, which are everybody thinks of as our major pollinator. But really, on the right are just a few of the many thousands of species of native bees that we have, and they are actually better at pollination services than our European honeybees. So we need to, we need to be thinking and planning for both those types of bees when we plan our yards. So how can we turn this around? Um, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about eight or seven steps you can take to do that. Um, as we go through the slides, you're going to be seeing um, this, these sort of pink uh, uh, numbers that come up in parentheses. Those are the numbers of butterflies and moth that each plant hosts. In other, in other words, the adult butterfly lays her egg on that plant. The larvae eat that plant. So those are called host plants. Um, so I have lists of all these plants and a bibliography with the links and information um, at the end. Um, once again, you can email me about that. Good news, there is good news. I know it sounds dire. Um, we can su support and restore biodiversity across the world. And in fact, your assignment today is to save the world. <laughs> I know that sounds bizarre, but it's a good thing to aim for. We can reverse the insect decline and save our beautiful birds. And we do that by making our immediate environment look like this. A layered landscape that's diverse and supports life. So um, it's nice, this looks like a park, but you can make your yard look like this as well, um, instead of like this. <laughs> These landscapes, which cover most of the United States at this point, you know, if you think about the suburbs, if you think about city lands, those kinds of things, these are sterile landscapes. They are not supporting life. And in fact, they are contributing to ecosystem destruction. So we're going to talk about that. Um, here's a flowering current. This is one of our native plants. And you can, about 73% of the continental United States is privately owned. We can't expect national wild areas to shelter all of nature for us. So we need to be conservationists in our cities, towns, yards, farms, and roadways, um, road sites. Um, there's not enough acreage left in the wild really to sustain nature. So you have control over your property you can do these things and encourage your neighbors to do the same. So the deal is that native plants don't want to be eaten. No plant wants to be eaten. <laughs> and so they produce really nasty chemicals to deter the insects that come to eat them. Um, insects have evolved defenses against those. And um, the so their larvae can then eat the vegetation of certain families of plants or even certain genera of plants. So some, some caterpillars are very, very specific. The female moth or butterfly will only lay her eggs on that plant. And you're all familiar with the one that we're thinking of, which is the monarch, which only lays its eggs on milkweed. Members of anything, any species of milkweed in the genus of Sclepius, the monarch will lay its eggs on. Monarch caterpillars can't eat anything else. So they're very, very specialized. Um, and 90% of insects eat plants and they can develop and reproduce only on the plants that they share evolutionary history with. Um, so just the genera or even the species of plant, we know about the monarchs. This is another example. This is the California pipe vine swallowtail and she only lays her eggs on the California pipe vine. Aristolochia californica. She has to have that plant available to be able to lay eggs and grow her babies. So native plants have adapted to their hungry, hungry caterpillars. The caterpillars are not gonna be able to take the plant out 
<laughs> because native plants and native insects, they, they know what they're doing together. So here are seven steps that you can do at home to encourage neighbors and the broader community to do the same. Um, if you're a note taker like me, you can write these down, but once again, I'll, I can send you a link. So step one, <laughs> remove at least, and I do mean at least half your lawn. Um, and I know that horrifies people, but um, lawns are not non-native. They, they have shallow root systems. They need frequent watering. They produce toxic runoff to our streams. Um, and the two cycle engines that of leaf blowers and lawnmowers that we use um, pollute incredibly our, our atmosphere. And the noise disturbs uh, local wildlife. Birds and insects and other things uh, can't, and anything that's out there is gonna run from those sounds. So there you go. They don't protect the soil. Bad news. And here's a truly horrifying little graphic. <laughs> So there are 45 million acres of lawn in the U.S. That's too much acreage in, in a um, sterile uh, state. Two billion gallons of gas for lawn equipment, four billion pounds of CO2 emitted, three, 13 billion pounds of toxic uh, air pollutants, 100 million pounds of pernicious lawn chemicals and fertilizers that make their way to the streams and kill our aquatic insects, and then 9 billion gallons of water a day, and then repeat that every single year. That is more pollution than automobiles are putting into the air. So it's really, really important that we remove a lot of our lawn acreage. So um, you could do this. You can mow a portion of it where you want to walk and um, leave the rest, overseed it with wildflowers and use it for um, a meadow space if you have big acreage like this. Or if you have a smaller area, you could do this. Make a part of it this, this flower garden, which is a floral resource for pollinators, put, put in some shrubs that the pollinators can utilize as well. Um, and that is um, a way to approach removal of some of your lawn and still keep some that you can go and utilize. Um, so the purple arrow over here are non-native turf grasses. You can see how shallow the roots are. Um, when we grow these things, these monocultures, we're using too much water. Um, if, in, if we planted natives instead, they have long roots, they support life, uh, insects can eat them and feed at them. They sequester carbon. Plants draw carbon from the atmosphere down into the, their root systems, and it's then trapped in the soil. So they are sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere. They clean and filter water that falls as rain. They enrich the soil. They support pollinators and food webs, and they help moderate weather. Um, and these are just the herbaceous plants. These are just the plants that are, you know, up to six feet tall. Um, we're not talking about trees and shrubs next, you know, yet. So here's the deal. By removing half of the lawns nationwide, we could add more native acreage than Everglades, Yellowstone, Yosemite, Grand Canyon, Mount Rainier, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, North Cascades, Badlands, Olympic, Sequoia, Denali, and Great Smoky Mountains combined. That's incredible. If every yard in the US did this and removed half their lawn, we would have that much more acreage, more than these national parks. Hmm. So we're, Doug Townley refers to this as a homegrown national park. If we could get this to happen, we would then have a national park that stretched all the way across the country because it would be space for native insects and animals. So the plan is that we want uh, the red arrow that you see here, let's see if I can get it, there it is, is what most yards look like now. Maybe your yard looks like this now. We hope that your yard will look like the yellow arrow soon. More trees, more shrubs, more layered vegetation around with paths of lawn for you to utilize for croquet and the dogs to poop on and the kids to play on and 
all that. And then hopefully eventually everybody does this and our neighborhoods start looking like this, right? That our neighborhoods begin to look like the homegrown national park that we're talking about with those layers of vegetation throughout and continuous for wildlife to move through. Step two, so step one was remove your lawn. Step two, please remove the, the non-native plants, especially the invasive plants from your yard. I know I used to grow fennel in my yard. This is fennel and um, I love it as an herb. Unfortunately, it's on the Oregon invasive species list as is this beautiful butterfly bush. This is out in the wild. You can see that this is out in a mountain setting. Nobody went out here and planted this. A bird flew over and pooped out a seed. And now we've got Budlea growing in the wild and displacing na native plants. This is a really drastic situation. Here's another one. So uh, invasives are a huge problem. Be sure you're aware of what plants in your garden can be potential invasives. And you can do that by going to this link down here this Garden Smart Guide to Non-Invasive Plants, and they have suggestions for natives that you can use to replace those plants that are in your yard that might be invasive that you can take out. So invasive species, we know they get carried into the wild by animals and the wind, and they often break bud and flower earlier in the year than our natives. They provide less or no nutrition to native wildlife, and they crowd out and compete with our native vegetation. So this is English ivy growing up in the forest near Portland. If any of you have driven on those freeways up there, you see that stuff scrambling up and choking the trees. Scotch broom, everybody knows what that is. Well, it's from Scotland, doesn't belong here. Here's English laurel. People are putting this as hedges in their yard. It makes berries. And now it's going into our forests. It's not feeding any caterpillars. So get it out. <laughs> we can give you suggestions for hedges that you can build out of native plants. So they impoverish our, our ecosystems. Um, so um, if you're like me, when I, I've been gardening all my life and it wasn't until about, I'd say three years ago when I realized some of the bad decisions I was making because I was always selecting um, plants based on the criteria that I um, found important. Um, and in fact, I needed to be thinking a little more carefully about that. Um, so we haven't, um, we make plant choices based on what our eye likes um, or what we, what we want in our yard, um, which leads us to, uh, but non-native plants just don't provide the kind of um, services that we necessarily need. That leads us to step three, which is to plant native plants. So as you're taking out those invasives, as you're removing some of the non-natives that perhaps you can replace, um, you wanna make sure when you go to the nursery that you're selecting plants that are straight native plants. This is Philadelphus, it's a beautiful, shrub, um, a forest shrub that we have. Uh, it's called mock orange and it has this delightful fragrance. It's just a beautiful, um, it looks gorgeous in, you know, in and around other trees that you're putting in. Um, so now we need to talk about, okay, we need to balance the, the aesthetic things that we were, that we were looking for, the, you know, our, our, um, our visual aesthetics and and look at these services that plants can provide for us. Pollinator habitat, food web value, wildlife appreciation, carbons, all those things that native plants provide that non-natives do not. And that really gives us the balance that we want in our yard. So plant choice matters when you go. Here's another example of native plants building soil. Um, look at the native roots and then look at the comparison to the agricultural roots. That's probably wheat or barley. Um, and then next to native bunch grasses. So you can see those 10 foot roots um, are providing those ecosystem services. 
So native insects have co-evolved with native plants and most insects specialize on a particular species of plant. Um, here's our, uh, one of our sphinx moths at a camas, our native camas, which is a bulb that you can grow in your garden. Um, you know, maybe choose those instead of, or alongside the daffodils that you're growing um, so that the moths can come and get something from the bulbs that come up in the spring. Um, and to me, this is the most important part of this presentation here. Our native plants, our native caterpillars have to eat native plants. This is red twig dogwood, beautiful native shrub, streamside shrub, um, deciduous. It has that beautiful red bark in winter, lovely flowers, and uh, caterpillars love to eat it. Look at how many um, species of caterpillar, 54 species of caterpillar uh, will eat that. So most of our songbirds must, the reason caterpillars are so important is that most of our songbirds have to feed their nestlings caterpillars. If you don't have caterpillars, you're not going to have birds in your yard. Um, and feeding them with just uh, seed feeders is not going to do it because even the seed eaters have to feed their young caterpillars. The babies can't eat seed. They can't digest it and they will die if the parents try to feed them that. So here are some of our little tinier native birds, titmice, bush tits, and chickadees. And um, these are um, acrobatic little in they insect eaters. They feed in shrubs and trees all around your yard. They um, are found in mixed flocks. They're called gleaning guilds. So they come in and a whole bunch of them will be twittering around in your bushes eating stuff. And they glean insects for food. They'll eat some seeds as well, but mostly they're looking for insects. Now, to grow a chickadee, a chickadee, a grown chickadee, a, an adult chickadee, weighs about 0.35 ounces. That's about the weight of four pennies. And those, those parents have to feed their babies worms or um, caterpillars, some kind of insect food, in the nest. And then for two weeks after they come out of the nest, so to rear one clutch of young, a pair of chickadees, that's two little adult chickadees, have to catch between 6,000 and 9,000 insects or caterpillars to feed their babies. That's a lot of caterpillars that those little guys have to work from dawn to dusk and they, and they work constantly bringing food to the nest. And then that, that doesn't count how many they have to feed them after the babies come out of the nest and are still being actively fed by parents. So if you want chickadees, you want breeding chickadees in your yard, you need to be growing trees and shrubs that grow caterpillars that those chickadees eat, right? So why do we need to grow pet caterpillars? Why caterpillars for heaven's sakes? Why not anything else? Why can't I put out mealworms? Well, uh, it could be because they're beautiful and they are, caterpillars are cool looking. Could be because they have these great names, right? Um, just wonderful names. There's that uh, swallowtail again, that pipevine swallowtail again. It's got a great looking caterpillar. Um, this is a Cercropia moth, also has a great looking caterpillar. But really it's because caterpillars are soft, they're large, they're high in protein, they're high in fats, they're the best source of carotenoids, which are the chemicals that you need for good eyesight and sexual uh, fertility and uh, a bunch of different things to keep us healthy. But most of all, it's easy to stuff down a baby bird's throat. This is like a giant natural sausage. It's like a big bratwurst that you can bring back to the nest and really parent birds really just stuff those down the baby's craw, right? So there can't be any chickadees unless there are enough caterpillars. And uh, that's just for tiny chickadees. Think of what bigger birds are gonna require. So our bigger birds, like our warblers, are gonna need more caterpillars. Um, here's, um, they like to glean insects um, from leaves of trees and shrubs. So um, if one of the caterpillars here, when you've got coffee berry, there are 21 different caterpillars, that this the species of caterpillar that they could find. If one of those doesn't do well in a given year, there are still 20 other species of caterpillar that the birds can find on that coffee berry. Um, so our bluebirds and our robins, our thrushes, um, those feed in leaf litter, um, trees and shrubs. 
Um, look how important leaf litter is to these birds. This entire nest of these hermit thrushes is made from leaves and pine needles woven together. So leaf litter is a big deal. Um, woodpeckers. Woodpeckers like to, these are all our western woodpeckers, flickers and sapsuckers. They like to drill into trees um, and uh, get the insects from under the bark. So they're a little bit different that way, but they do collect caterpillars for their young. Um, and then uh, acorn woodpeckers, of course, collect and cache acorns. So if you're raking up all the leaves and the acorns in your yard, you're not gonna have acorn woodpeckers. Um, wrens that like to forage um, in vegetation from the ground to the high canopy, you might be seeing a little bit of a pattern emerge here. Where are these birds feeding? Where are they gathering the food to feed their young, right? Um, so jays, here are our blue jays, our ravens, that family, the corvids, magpies, crows, really intelligent birds. Think of how many worms and, and uh, caterpillars they have to collect for their young, vireos. Um, also, foraging from ground to treetops. So you need to think about vertical as well as horizontal foraging opportunities for the, um, the, in the birds that are in your yard. Um, fly catchers, of course, catch flies. These are our Western fly catchers and our Western peewees and phoebes. And that means that they are flying across the environment and grabbing things right out of the air and eating them. So, you know, when insects are flying over a floral resource, these birds are flying off from a perch, grabbing them and flying back to wait for the next insect to come by. So you also need your little meadows of flowers. Um, so plant choice really, really matters. Here are some examples. So here we have a uh, willow, which hosts 312 species of, of uh, moth and butterfly larva. Here we have deer brush, which is a native shrub, 93 species of caterpillar eat this brush. So this butterfly and moth caterpillars are on this, eating it all the time. And um, our service berry, which has uh, 81. All good choices for your yard. Um, so you can really accomplish a lot in your yard by selecting what we call keystone plants. These are super powerful plants that host a lot of species of moth and butterfly. Um, in other words, they make a lot of, not only a, an abundance of caterpillars, but a huge diversity of caterpillars. Um, and one of those is of course the white oak. Um, I'm gonna share a little research with you from Dr. Tallamy um, that he did back in 2015, I believe. He had a 14, he, he poked an acorn into his um, 10 acres and, and a, an oak grew and a 14 um, year old oak uh, he went out in uh, July, on July 25th of 2014, and he counted all of the caterpillars that were just at chest height on the, you know, like a two foot span where he could see what was there. Um, and, uh, and it was a young tree, a 14 year old oak, it's not very big. And he counted 410 caterpillars, 19 different species on that tree. So that's a pretty good deal for a young tree. I've got pretty good stuff going on there. That's great. Then he went uh, uh, the next day and counted on a black cherry um, that he had also grown in his yard and found that, oh, there were 239 caterpillars, also 14 different species. So he has good diversity and he's got great numbers. The chickadees in his yard can come there to either of those keystone trees and glean all the caterpillars that they need up in that canopy for their nestlings. So he has breeding chickadees in his yard. So here are native uh, cherries that you can grow in your yard. We have three species, um, bitter cherry, choke cherry, and Klamath plum. So our bitter cherry, Prunus emarginata, has really nice bark. It's got lovely spring blooms for the bees, cherries for the birds to eat. And of course, the caterpillars are munching away on that. 
Here is um, Prunus virginiana. This is beautiful fall color, um, great foliage for the insects to eat, great floral resource for our bees, and look at the forage for the birds over here. Um, Klamath plum, it's a, a tall shrub, kind of a, it, it likes to make thickets. So you would want to plant this probably out on along a, a fence line if you have property somewhere, but it, it actually has edible fruit that humans can use for, um, for jams and preserves and that kind of stuff. Uh, so it's a kind of a nice thing to be able to have it do double duty as a human food as well as a food for wildlife and caterpillars, of course. So by contrast, let's look at a, um, a non-native and actually highly invasive species, um, Bradford pear. And we have a lot of these planted here in the valley, um, but they're more of a problem on the East Coast where there's abundant rainfall and um, they're not supposed to make fruit. They don't make big fruit, but they do make a small little tiny pear. And of course the birds eat them and the birds go off and they poop the seeds all over the place. And now this is the most invasive species on the Eastern seaboard. It's a, it's a, a non-native pear from Asia. That's a cultivar. So it provides nothing. As you can see, one species of caterpillar eat this. It's not providing anything for wildlife and it's polluting our ecosystems. So instead of planting that in your yard, even though it's, it's a lovely tree, try planting something like black hawthorn. Um, this is a native. Uh, it has great resources for our wildlife. That's a better choice. Burning bush. Everybody loves this. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous plant. It's a, an Oregon invasive. It's out in the wild now. Um, very bad. Caterpillars on burning bush. Once again, one species. It's not doing anything for us. So if we add caterpillars to sub suburban ecosystems by planting um, natives, we will be breeding birds. You will actually have birds breeding in your yard. And you don't need to rip out all your non-native plants. Let me just say that because people start to panic. <laughs> I grow a mix of natives and non-native species in my yard and here they are. These are the non-natives that, that I grow. A lot of those are, um, are herbs, which I think everybody should be growing in their yard because I really think people should be growing their own food and their own herbs. And the herbs are great because they evolved with European honey, honeybees. And so our bees, our honeybees, utilize these massively. So do our native bees. They like the herbs that we grow in our garden and they can use them as a pollen and nectar resource. They won't, you know, our, our moths and butterflies won't utilize them, but that's okay, our other pollinators will. The two that are crossed out, butterfly bush and fennel, I've already spoken about before. Those are the invasives that I took out of my yard. But these are the natives. My yard is a quarter acre lot in Medford. My front yard on the corner is this plant list right here. This is what I'm growing in that space. And the backyard is my food garden. So I have raised beds and a food garden back there. Um, so all of these make great, um, most of the shrubs are producing caterpillars for my birds and then other flowers are producing nectar and pollen for pollinators. So making insects, that supports life. Um, this is mountain lilac, really powerful plant, one of those, uh, one of those powerhouse uh, keystone plants. And there are some of the butterflies that that plant supports, just, just a few. So as Dr. Chalamet was doing his research over the years, he's come up with a list um, and, and this idea that you only need to choose a few very, very powerful um, um, genera of plants to get massive benefit in your yard. So this, what this shows is all the plants that he's looked at over the years, these, most of these over here are non-natives, but over as you get over here, these are mostly our native plants. 
And as you can see, the native plants are supporting, there are those numbers again, the native plants are supporting more species of caterpillar. So if you were only to plant five trees on property that you might have, if you chose oak, black cherry, willow, maple, and pine, you can get massive amounts of species of butterfly and moth utilizing just these five species of tree. So you really, um, plant choice really matters and it's easy to bump up the productivity by planting um, those keystone native plants. Here's an example. Uh, in Oregon, our keystone plants are a little bit different from what he gets on the East Coast. So here you go. Um, if you plant a willow, you get 312 species. If you plant a cherry, you get, um, you, now you've added that to the willow that you just planted. Now you have a total of 552. Add a poplar, add a, an alder, add an oak. You can see the numbers going up as you add more of these keystone plants. If you planted just those 10 top keystone plants, you would have 1905 different species of caterpillar, um, moth and butterfly, utilizing your property. Now, all of us can't be planting those giant trees in our homes if we're living on quarter acre lots or 10th acre lots. But you can, you can pick some of the really powerful shrubs to be the um, dominant landscape plants. So willow, 312 uh, species of caterpillar, <clears throat> ginkgo. Lots of people love ginkgo trees and they're beautiful. They're non-native. They don't produce caterpillars. They're not producing food for our birds. Native prunus, um, those are our cherries, support um, 240 species of caterpillar. Mandina, which is planted everywhere, everywhere in suburban landscapes. It is not native and um, supports no caterpillars, but it also actually kills our native cedar waxwings because of the way waxwings eat. They come in, a robin can come to this Nandina and eat a few of these berries and fly off and be fine. Um, the cedar waxwings come in and the way they feed is that they gorge at a source until it's gone. And so the flock is here eating, 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 eating. There's cyanide in these seeds and they eat too Hello? much. If they no. fill up entirely, it can kill them. So please don't grow Nandina. Pyrus, this is the non-native, two species of caterpillar, not much help. So grow a native viburnum instead, 31 species of caterpillars and it's a pretty lovely plant. And it has nice berries for the birds as well. So always choose a native when you can. Here's our Oregon grape, that's our state flower. Great early floral resource for our pollinators. Once again, plant choice matters. By the way, this link is to a wonderful site that you can go in, put in your zip code and it will give you the top plants for pollinators, um, herbaceous plants and also woody trees and shrubs. So it's a really, really powerful resource for you wherever you're living here in the valley. Step four, avoid or minimize the use of herbicides um, for obvious reasons. Um, if you're growing plants that are growing insects, you don't wanna be spraying insecticides around, right? And we don't wanna be spraying um, the chemicals that, um, that will run off into the streams um, and get up into the plant tissues. We know that um, most of you have seen these kinds of flow charts before, but we know that neonicotinoids, which are sold in treated nursery stock a lot of the time, actually penetrate, I mean, they are taken up by the plant. They move into all the plant tissues, including pollen and nectar. Um, and, and that um, affects our bees and butterflies that are feeding on those flowers. So there's direct poisoning that occurs. Um, there is um, secondary poisoning that occurs from both the runoff and the leaching of the, of the things through the soil and then into the water. And so our waterways are very polluted um, by the chemicals that we're buying in, you know, they're filling every row in the big box stores. So try, 
when you're growing natives, you shouldn't be needing those kinds of chemicals any longer. And if you don't have lawn, you're not going to be buying weed and feed. All right, here's native spirea. This is Douglas spirea, nice big powerful plant, um, 54 species of butterfly and moth. So um, we've covered caterpillars. Um, when we're growing uh, native plants in our yards, we focus on these two groups of insects, the caterpillars, which we've covered. And now on to bees, um, because the bees and adult butterflies and moths are looking for floral resources. So step five, you wanna build a pollinator garden. So this is like your little pocket meadow that you're gonna be putting in, um, in place of some of that lawn that you've taken out. Uh, so this is pearly everlasting, a um, nice uh, floral resource for our bees. And who are our major pollinators? Well, um, these are these are little native bees. Aren't they beautiful? Look at those. And most people aren't even aware of these. And of course, our little butterfly here. Um, so one species of honeybee, that's the one in the top left corner. There she is. Um, 4,000 species of native bee. And I'm only showing you four here. There are 4,000 of them. And then of course, are 14,000 species of moths and butterflies, all of whom have to visit floral resources as adults because the adults have sucking mouth parts. They have long tubular mouth parts. That's what adult butterflies and moths eat is nectar. All right, bees are critical for pollination needs, so we want to plan for them. Here's a huckleberry. 130 um, butterflies and moths hosted, but it also has, is a beautiful um, flower resource for our bumblebees. Bumblebees love members of the huckleberry family, that ericaceous family, um, and those are that's a good choice to put in a shady part of your yard. Um, so uh, most uh, productive native plants for native bee specialists. And bees specialize too. They specialize on pollen. They actually will go to flower resources that have the kind of pollen they need to grow their larva on. Because bees make pollen balls and they lay their eggs on those and the babies grow on that, our native bees. So different from honeybees, which are fed um, in the hive in a different in a different way than our native bees grow. So these are the are the the top contenders. So you can see goldenrods, willows, willow trees. Once again, the power of these trees, willows are an incredibly important floral resource, nectar and pollen resource for early flying bees in North America. If we don't have willow trees around and native willow trees, um, the, the pollinators suffer. Um, asters, blueberries, golden tops, fringed loosestrife, and sunflowers, the most important plants for our bees. 40 species of specialist bees on just those seven plants. If you can get three, five, or even all seven of these into your yard, you are going to do massive help for our bees. Goldenrods are common native plants. They provide pollen and nectar for bees and butterflies and other pollinator insects in the late summer and fall. And, and there are different kinds of goldenrods that actually flower in succession. So if you plant a couple different varieties, you extend the bloom time. So both native and honeybees use pollen from goldenrods to provision their nests. And you can see all these little bees here gathering, gathering the pollen off the uh, goldenrod. And um, it is a critical um, source of nectar uh, for monarchs to build up their fat reserves for migration and overwintering. So really, really, really an important late blooming flower in our valley here. So when you're planning for bees, I want you to think about plant families. Um, you, you wanna maximize uh, the pollinator species visiting your yard. So because the bees also specialize on different families of plants, you want to plan for several different families. So here's the carrot family. 
where you have dill, fennel, coriander, and parsley if you're a gardener, and the, and the bees will visit that. They will, go, they will come to that. Um, if you're growing a native, um, you want Lomation, Angelica, which is also an, an herb that we can utilize. Um, the mint family, and once again, you know those cultivars, you grow them in your vegetable garden. Um, cresses, alyssum, broccoli, cauliflower, those are great. Alyssum is a great floral resource for both our honeybees and our native bees. Beautiful floral resource. Asters, so powerful. The aster family, the daisy family, the sunflower family. Um, this is our native sunflower, Bolander sunflower. Makes massive amounts of these yellow flowers and the bees utilize it uh, heavily. And then if you leave the flower stalks up, the birds come in winter and eat the seeds. Um, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, so the aster family, really good choice. Pick a native, put it in your yard. Mint family. We've got some beautiful, obviously, um, our herbs on the cultivar side, but our natives are wonderful as well. Monardella is a beautiful plant. Um, the, the salvias and the horse mint, even horse mint, this is Agastaki, our native horse mint. Really, really beautiful floral resources for our bees. Bunch grasses. I know that sounds weird, but our, but our, the reason you're putting in bunch grasses is because there is an, a whole um, a whole uh, gang of little skipper butterflies that use this as overwintering uh, habitat. So you want to have native grasses for our, some of our butterflies and moths, which are going to actually overwinter in those bunches of grasses. So, and there are cultivars, of course, that you can put in and the natives. So always choose a native plant if you can, and if they'll work in your yard, Sometimes it's just not going to work. You, you want a certain look, you want a certain um, aesthetic, and the natives can be a little rangy, they can be a little wild, <laughs> they get a little crazy, you know. Sometimes the natives, they, they, they move around, they like to, they like to grow, and, and they like to um, be uh, neglected. And so if any of those things are happening in your yard, if you tend to be a neglectful gardener like me, natives do great. Um, so what you want to avoid, and I, I really can't stress this enough, um, are nativars and cultivars that have any of these qualities. If they have different colored leaves than you would normally see on the plant, the insects can't lay their eggs in there. The caterpillars can't deal with those new chemicals that cause that purple coloration here in the elderberry. You want to plant the native elderberry, the straight native, and keep asking at the nurseries for the straight native. Put pressure on the nurseries to start carrying straight natives, not native ours, which can be, they're changed somehow by the horticultural industry. Straight native, straight native. Now dwarfing doesn't seem to be a problem Variegation often is not a problem. Variegation in leaf color because there are you know green parts there that the insect can still eat. But total change of the of the of the vegetation color is very is very harmful and non-productive for our native insects. The other thing that's non-productive are these kinds of doubled up flowers. Wow, they're eye candy for us. I know they look so cool please don't ever choose double flowers for your yard. And certainly not these crazily doubled ones. These are totally sterile flowers. They produce no pollen, no nectar. You put them out because you think you're doing something nice for the bees. You're not doing anything. You're just taking away space for another plot flower like the native that could actually provide ecosystem services and pollination uh, and um, pollinator opportunities for feeding. So, Single flowers always, if you can. Um, and, and we just kind of need to train our eye to think like a bee, to, to look at plants like the bees do. How is the bee gonna access this? How is it going to be um, beneficial for that? So different flower color than the native plants, big no-no. Different leaf color for the plants um, and different flower formation, right? 
double flowers, all not good things. So avoid those. Pollinators need uh, plants that bloom over a long period of time, obviously, because they come out in the spring and uh, they, they're still out flying right now. We've got bees still out in the garden. Um, so you choose a variety of blooming annuals, perennials, ground covers. I can't stress ground covers enough um, to keep the weeds, the other weeds you don't want down. Herbs, shrubs, and trees. Shrubs and trees, really, really critical. Um, that bloom across all seasons. Remember that vertical landscape we talked about earlier. Keep that in mind. Um, plan, uh, plan food for nesting and opportunities, um, food and nesting. So we want to provide them cover. We want to provide water. We want to provide food. And bees need pollen and nectar to reproduce. So once again, there are a bunch of our native bees um, and they are better than the honeybees for pollination services. They work more hours and longer in the year. And native bees nest in the ground. They nest in woody stems. They nest in pithy stems. Um, they nest in hollow stems. And so you often don't see these little guys in your yard. You're not even aware that they're out there. But the reason we want to leave some of the stem material in our gardens is because they're in there, in those dead stems. They go in there, the, the queens work during the warmer months building these little cavities, and they put their um, little guys into, here's the woody stem nesters, they're filling these little stems and tubes with their babies that will emerge next spring, all right? So here is an example of some of our little, our little bees, our leaf cutter bees, our wool carter bees, our mason bees. And here's an example of the nest they build. Here's a leaf cutter bee, a resin bee, and a mason bee. All of these have to overwinter in stems or in these wooden structures that we put in our yards. Um, and so it's important that we have habitat for them in our yards. And the way to provide that, and it's a two-year process, <laughs> is that in the fall, you're going to not, or in the spring, that plants grow. And um, you're going to leave in the fall. You're In the summer, they're going to um, bloom. The bees are going to be building their nests in uh, old stems that you've left from last fall. You're going to cut those stems back a little bit. And, and then in the fall, you're going to um, allow the stems from the year before to just sort of decompose and fall off. These, the bees have emerged during the summer from these stems that were left last year. But you want to leave the flower heads because the birds are going to come and eat these seeds. And then in spring, you're going to cut back the dead flower stalks again. Um, that the birds have taken the seeds out of. Here are the current stems you're cutting back to um, eight to 24 inches. The old ones have decomposed and fallen to the ground and are just part of the litter that you're leaving, hopefully you're leaving in your garden. Anyway, this little graphic is available to you. Um, it's a great way to remember how to clean up or not clean up in the fall. <laughs> Don't go and clear your yard in the fall, please. Um, we, we'll talk a little more about that later. There are also ground nesting bees. We have bumblebees and other natives that nest right in the ground, usually next to um, rodent burrows. That's how they access a place that they can then tunnel into and build their nest. So this is what my yard looks like in June. If you drive by my house or you walk by my house in East Medford, it's kind of, um, it's blooming away there. Then it looks like this in October which um, probably doesn't make my neighbors very happy, but the insects are in there and they're living uh, through the winter in those stems. And I, I wanna make a, a quick uh, observation about some people don't like, you know, they wanna clean up in fall and they wanna, and so they go, well, I'll just provide habitat like this. I'll put out bee boxes, I'll put out all this stuff for insects and stuff, that'll be great. Yeah, unless you vigilantly maintain these, they are problematic. Commercial bee houses, and please, 
I just ask people not to buy the commercial bee houses because they're they they aren't easily taken apart and cleaned and they and they cause major problems. This um, these are hairy footed pollen mites and this little mason bee is absolutely covered in those mites. When you have a commercial house that's not regular bee house that's not regularly cleaned, it um, it will concentrate um, predators and parasites. Um, you have to main, you absolutely have to maintain them um, with bleach and everything else. You have to clean them out and bleach them and uh, to prevent this sort of thing. Um, it concentrates disease, so the insects can actually become um, diseased um, with funguses and all and bacterial infections and viruses. Um, and so, if you plant native plants, the, the native plants spread the bees out in the landscape and make them much less susceptible to this kind of, this is tragic to me. That's just, that, that's a tragedy. And it's because people have been using those commercial bee houses. So please avoid those. Hey, Lynn, I yeah. hate to interrupt. However, we are just about, um, it is 1055 and we okay. are done at 11. So um, I, if you want to wrap up a bit and we can open up the floor for some questions. You bet. All you right. Bet. Awesome. And people can go through the yeah. rest of this on their own. It's These are just, um, yeah, sure. Go ahead and fire away at the questions. Okay. Um, so if anybody has any questions, feel free to go ahead and type in the chat. We do have um, one question, it looks like, from Kathy, who is asking for suggestions for native plants for dry areas. Right. Um, so Douglas uh, Spirea doesn't mind being dry. Um, if you were looking for a shrub, um, coffee berry is a great evergreen shrub for dry sites. Um, and I have lists of lists of things that I can give to you. Um, if you're looking for flowers, goldenrod and Douglas Aster need absolutely no extra water during the summer. They will bloom and they need no supplemental water. They would like it if you're watering your garden. They, they don't mind that at all. But if you're, if you're doing a water-wise garden, you could plant goldenrod and Douglas Aster and they will not need supplemental water. Okay, uh, we have two more questions, one from Ian and one from Fred. Do you have any recommendations for apartment planters or recommendations for shady areas? Apartment planters, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, natives, because of their deep uh, root systems, most natives are not going to do well in, um, in planters. If, if you're looking to just grow um, pollinator plants like flor flowers, um, I would I would recommend planting herbs and um, alyssum to help the bees out. You could do that in planters because the European the herbs aren't going to need the deep rooting area. Um, the pots can't provide you with the kind of um, root uh, space that the natives are gonna need. So I would recommend growing your own herbs and, um, and, and putting alyssum in. Alyssum is a great floral resource for um, bees. And, and you know, if you wanna grow things like zinnias, zinnias work great as a summer flower. Um, they are very attractive to pollinators. They're not a native, but, but they'll work. So yeah, if that's helpful, I hope. <laughs> okay. Um, due to fire danger, we are told to not have layered landscaping that carries the flames up to the trees. Do you have any comments? Yeah. Um, and yes, that is an issue. Um, the deal, the deal with uh, most of our natives is that again, you know, if you have a small lot uh like in we have in our suburbs it's that's going to be an issue because you need to have a um you know a safe space around your home that is really only in a grass or herbs 
um, so that the fire as it approaches your house, it'll burn through those grasses in like 20 seconds and that's not going to impact your home. If you've got a safe space cleared around your home. In terms of the vegetation getting up into the trees, um, yeah, uh, our native plants and trees are fire adapted. And what that means is that the, that the, um, the fire will move through and in, in, in a regular fire situation, the fire would move through and it would take out that under, that under layer of vegetation. Um, it would burn through that. Those plants will regenerate. From the roots. They come back after fire. So your shrubs are going to regenerate. The, the fire, if the trees are really dry, yes, the fire is going to get up into the canopy and take out those trees. Um, so our drought, our drought conditions have exacerbated the problem with our fires, the hot, higher temperatures, the drought conditions. So it's really good if you're in an area where you feel like fire could could be an issue for you, and at this point now it's everybody. Check with um, check with some of the local fire agencies, then they can make recommendations about that. But water-wise gardens are not a bad idea in terms of uh, and natives are not a bad idea because if you do have something come through and burn some of your vegetation away, it's going to regenerate. Um, Certainly you don't want it up against your house. And this is one of those do as I say, not as I do, because I've got vegetation all around my house. Um, it's, it, it is, there is vegetation there. Um, I take it down in the winter, um, but it regrows. So I have new green growth in the summer. But you know, if we get a catastrophic fire through the neighborhood, um, it, it's gonna go up. I, can, I don't have any control over that. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a kind of a balancing act. Okay, so it looks like we're getting quite a few questions here. Um, I'm going to pose a few more questions and perhaps Lynn, if you could put the slide up that has your email address and contact info up. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna pose a few more questions that were in this chat. And for those of you who did not get your questions answered, um, please feel free to email Lynn because I'm Absolutely. sure she would be more than happy to discuss this with you. Um, we have a question here that looks like it is, um, I live at uh, 1440 of a elevation, oak and madrone mostly. How do you find the best plants for high elevation? Well, pretty much any of the, uh, the if, if you go to Native Plant Finder, and it's the link is here in this presentation, and put in your zip code, what zip code are you? That's probably Ashland, or um, you're probably up the valley a bit. I, I, 1,400 feet is not really high elevation. 4,000 feet would be high elevation, but um, because Medford is 1,300 feet. Um, so any of the plants that, that work in uh, zip code 97504 or 97501, the Medford zip codes, Central Point zip codes, uh, Talent Phoenix zip codes, put those in a native plant finder and it will bring you up a list of plants that will do fine in, in your area. Okay, let's see. Um, we see I see one that is, um, I live on the coast and woodland. I've tried several, several species of milkweed to no avail. Any info on a species that would work? So the native, and so you're on the coast, um, native species of, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, native species of milkweed uh, that will work uh, in Oregon are uh, showy milkweed and narrow leaf milkweed. Now, if you're trying to grow those from seed, you need to stratify the seed, which means they need to be planted out in the fall. Um, mark where you've planted them. They need to go through cold, wet stratification. If they're not out in the cold, the damp over winter, or you can roll them in a damp paper towel in a plastic bag and put them in your refrigerator and plant them out in spring. But they, if you don't stratify those uh, seeds, they will not come up. Our native seeds have to be stratified with cold, wet rain over the period of like 
Oh, uh, 30 to 120 days. Okay, yeah. so I'm going to end with this last question. And once again, if your question did not get asked, please feel free to email Lynn, um, you know, and perhaps she will be able to get that information for you. Absolutely. I'm going to end this with this question because I feel like this would be super helpful to everyone who has posed a question. What would be your top resources for learning more local info? So, um, I would say uh, Pollinator Project Road Valley, um, OSU uh, Master Gardeners out at the Jackson County Extension. I run the Native Plants Nursery out at the Extension, so you can email me. Um, there are lots of agencies here in the Valley that are working on um, restoration and promoting um, native plants. Also, you can go to Plant Oregon, which is a um, a nursery up on Wagner Creek that's all native plants and Shooting Star Nursery carries a lot of natives. All right. Well, thank you once again, Lynn, for educating everyone here on, you know, it's a very great topic on growing native plants. Um, you know, I learned a thing myself and I am excited to see what I can do here. So Great. once again, uh, thank you, Lynn, and thank you everyone so much for joining us. You guys have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Thanks everybody. Bye.